Hello everyone. So the setup for today's problem is that we have a chain coiled up at the edge of a table and that's that stuff there on my diagram. It's crucial to notice that it's coiled up rather than already stretched out and we'll think about why that has a big impact on our method uh, in a little bit. We have part of the chain hanging down vertically off the edge of the table and I've defined the length of chain that's hanging down to be x and x can vary with time, right? As soon as we let go of the chain it's going to uh, start falling down and x is going to be increasing with time. And I've also defined the downwards velocity of the chain to be v, which again can uh, depend on time. We've got some initial conditions. Uh, firstly, that x of time zero is x naught. All that's saying is that at t equals zero, uh, there is a length of chain x naught, which is a constant just hanging down off the edge. And uh, v of time zero is zero, meaning we release it from rest uh, when t is zero. So what we want to do is find v as a function of x, in other words, how fast the chain is going as a function of how much of it is uh, hanging down off the edge. Notice that I'm not saying v as a function of time, simply because that's much harder to find. In principle, if we know v of x, we can use the fact that v is dx by dt um, to set up and solve a differential equation for x as a function of t and then differentiate that. But the integral that you have to do is very, very hard and you have to get special functions involved. So we're going to stick to v of x um, for this video. So we're going to use a force-based approach. Don't be tempted to use conservation of energy um, because as I'll be discussing a bit later on, it doesn't work uh, in cases like this where you have a chain which is initially coiled and is sort of gradually set into motion. So let's use uh, Newton's second law to set up a differential equation that we can solve. And Newton's second law in its full form says that the external force F is the rate of change of momentum, which I'm just gonna write as d by dt of mv. Now, watch the external force acting on the chain, pulling it downwards. Well, it's just its own weight, and weight is equal to mass times gravitational field strength. Um, it's helpful here to define a derived parameter, which is the mass per unit length. Um, I haven't defined that as one of the initial parameters of the problem because it doesn't end up entering into our final result. We'll think about why that is later on, but I'm just going to define, uh, for the purpose of working, the um, uh, the linear density mass per unit length to be lambda, then the mass of the part of the chain which is hanging down and therefore causing the chain to accelerate downwards is lambda x, and we just multiply that by g to turn it into a weight. So that's the external force on the chain. Now the right-hand side of this Newton's second law equation is still going to be d by dt of something. The m in your mv for momentum uh, is still lambda x, right? it's the same mass that we had on the left-hand side, and the velocity we can write as x dot. We could write it as v, um, but I just want to emphasize for now that x dot is the derivative of x. Now you can already see that the lambdas cancel from both sides, so it's not going to uh, be of any importance uh, for the rest of our working. Uh, I'm just going to write the left-hand side as gx, and then we'll use the product rule to expand out the right-hand side. So if we differentiate the x, we get x dot, and then there's another x dot, so it's x dot squared. Then we leave the x and we differentiate the x dot. So a second term is going to be x times x double dot. Now this is a non-linear second order ordinary differential equation, which is very, very hard to solve. So what we're gonna do is use a trick that allows us to transform it into a first order linear ordinary differential equation, which is much easier to solve. And this is a trick that's often useful when you end up with these non-linear equations of motion uh, in classical mechanics. So the trick I'm talking about involves the acceleration term, the x double dot. Now, x double dot is the second derivative of x, or equivalently, it's the first derivative of x dot um, with respect to time. Now, I'm going to apply the chain rule to that definition um, and write it as dx dot by dx and then times dx by dt so that you can imagine the, uh, the dx is cancelling. But dx by dt, this bit here, is just the same as x dot. So you can write this as x dot times dx dot by dx. So you've got some variable x dot uh, multiplied by its own derivative with respect to some other variable x. Now that's the kind of thing that happens when you differentiate things using the chain rule, right? You have an expression multiplied by a derivative and if you think hard enough you'll be able to convince yourself that this is the same as what you would get if you were to differentiate with respect to x uh, a half x dot squared. And this works because if you differentiate a half x dot squared with respect to x dot, then you just get x dot, and then the chain rule would give you this extra factor here. So we've concluded that x double dot is the same as d by dx of a half x dot squared. So let's go back to our equation of motion and rewrite it using this derivative identity. The left-hand side is still gx, 
We've still got our x dot squared term, but now using our identity, you can write the final term as plus half x dx dot squared by dx. So I want to do a couple of things to this equation. Firstly, I'm going to write x dot as v from now on because we're done with all of this sort of uh, derivative identity stuff. And I'm also going to reorder the terms and do some division uh, and multiplication to put it into a more standard looking form. So I'm going to multiply everything by two and divide everything by x so that the derivative term is just sitting on its own. Um, it's going to be dv squared by dx. If we've multiplied by two and divided by x, then we're gonna have plus two over x v squared. And your right-hand side, which was previously the left-hand side, um, is now just 2g. Now this equation might still look like a non-linear differential equation because your velocities are still squared. However, it is really a linear differential equation and a first order linear differential equation in v squared, right? Because this is this, the derivative of v squared plus some function of x times v squared equals a constant. So it's a linear first order differential equation and it's the type of differential equation that can be solved using an integrating factor. Um, I'll also just introduce uh, some of the sort of standard notation. The coefficient of um, the variable that you're solving for, the function that you're solving for uh, is usually called p. So let me call that p and it's a function of x and the right hand side uh, is usually called q. It can be a function of x in general, but it happens to be a constant uh, in this case. So the idea of an integrating factor is that you find a special function that you can multiply the whole equation by so that the left-hand side can be easily integrated. If you want to see the full details and derivation of uh, how this method works, I do have a video on that, which you could go and have a look at. I'm going to assume you're vaguely familiar with that for now, though, and uh, just work out our integrating factor. So I'm going to call it mu of x. That's the symbol that I've usually seen it used for that. It is e to the integral of p of x with respect to x. And here, that means it's e to the integral of two over x dx, because p was the coefficient of the function that you're solving for, which is v squared, right? So if you integrate two over x, you get two ln x, so it's e to the two ln x, but we can use some uh, identities, logarithmic identities, say that two ln x is the same as log of x squared. So if you exponentiate the log of x squared, you just get x squared. So that's our integrating factor. So what you have to do is multiply the whole equation by mu of x, your integrating factor. So that's pretty straightforward. It's going to give us x squared times the derivative of v squared with respect to x plus 2x times v squared is equal to 2g times x squared. So here's the differential equation we're trying to solve. And the left-hand side consists of two terms that look like they could have come from the product rule. And uh, you can uh, confirm that the left-hand side is just the derivative of x squared v squared. Because if you were to expand that using the product rule, you would first leave the x squared alone, differentiate v squared. That's exactly what we've got in our first term there. Then you would differentiate the x squared, which gives you your 2x, and you'd leave the v squared alone. So that gives you uh, your second term. And it's no coincidence, of course, that it's worked out in this nice exact way, because that's exactly what integrating factors are designed to do. And uh, we just keep the right-hand side as 2gx squared. So that makes everything nice and easy to integrate with respect to x, because the left-hand side is just x squared v squared, because an integral undoes a derivative. The right-hand side, you just use a power rule, and you get two-thirds uh, gx cubed plus some constant. At this point, we can apply our uh, initial conditions. Um, so we know that uh, v is zero when t is zero, but also x is x zero when t is zero. And combining those two initial conditions in terms of time together tells you that v is zero when x is x is zero. So the left-hand side is going to be x naught squared times zero squared, so just zero. The right-hand side is gonna be two thirds uh, g x naught cubed plus c. And uh, that then of course gives you that c is minus two thirds of g x naught cubed. So we can substitute that c back into our uh, solution and do a bit of factorizing. So x squared v squared is, you can pull out a two thirds of g and then you get x cubed minus x naught cubed. And then you can divide by uh, x squared and just take the square root of everything. And you're going to end up with v is, put the square root on at the end, it's going to be 2g x cubed minus x naught cubed all over 3x squared 
and then we take the square root of the whole thing. We do, of course, want the positive square root um, just on physical grounds because you can see that the chain is always going to be uh, moving downwards because it's being pulled by gravity. Now, an important point that I alluded to at the beginning is that energy is not conserved in this problem. And you can uh, confirm that yourself if you want by trying to solve this problem using consideration of kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. And you'll find a different expression for V, which is not consistent um, with the one that we just derived. Now, the reason for that comes down to the fact that part of the chain is initially coiled. It's not initially stretched out and therefore um, each successive link of the chain has to be gradually set in motion by the part of the chain which is already falling down. And if you think about it, that happens via a series of collisions between uh, the successive links. Now, in general, there's no reason why we should assume that a given collision is elastic unless we have a good justification as to why that needs to be the case. And we don't really have such a justification here. And in fact, the fact that we got a, an answer which is inconsistent with conservation of energy using our uh, force-based method tells us that the collisions can't possibly be uh, elastic in this problem. And so the conclusion uh, is that energy is being lost due to inelastic collisions between the successive links of the chain. So some of that energy will go into uh, sound. You can imagine that this chain will be making some noise um, as it's falling down and gradually uncoiling. And of course, there will also be uh, small amounts of heat generated. I'm not saying that the chain is going to suddenly heat up by a measurable amount, um, but that heat energy will just be uh, dissipated quickly into the surroundings. My final observation I'd like to make uh, about this result is that it doesn't depend on the mass of the chain or equivalently the mass per unit length of the chain and the reason for that uh, can be traced back to the equivalence of gravitational and inertial mass. So that means that if you have more mass then you have a bigger force pulling it down, right? There's more weight acting because weight is proportional to mass but also you have more inertia. It's harder to accelerate uh, the moving chain if there's more mass, um, as Newton's second law tell tells us. But because gravitational and inertial mass happen to be equivalent, those two effects perfectly cancel each other out. And so um, given that fact, it does make sense that uh, the mass of the chain doesn't enter into our result. So we're done with this problem. Next time I'll be covering another chain related problem, an even more complicated one, both in terms of the physics and the maths involved. So I hope you'll join me uh, to have a look at that. So thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.